it's independent of time. Remember we said that there are what you would call stationary state solutions to your Schrodinger equation. What are stationary state solutions? This SS here means stationary state. Remember your wave function depends on coordinates and time, right? Stationary state solutions are those that you can write as a function of coordinates times function of time. And what's the, what's the form of the function of time? e to the negative i e t. Let me clear that up. The expression for the dependence on time is e to the negative i e t over h bar. Okay, and why are they called stationary states? Because when you take the, abs the square of the absolute value of the function, the time dependence goes away. So psi squared itself will just be little psi squared. It will be independent of time. Okay, so uh, how do you solve for this little psi? You solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay, so you solve for this little psi right here using this equation right here, h hat psi equals e psi, all right? Now, uh, in general, we said the solution to your time-dependent Schrodinger equation, it can be any linear combination of these stationary states. So if psi 1, so big psi 1, big psi 2, big psi 3, and so on are your stationary states, then any linear combination of those, if these c's are constant, then this psi right here will be a solution to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, okay? Now, what if your Hamiltonian depends on time? So, let's imagine then that our Hamiltonian is, consists of two parts. One part that doesn't depend on time, we call it our zero-order Hamiltonian, and a part that depends on time h prime over here. So what we have here, what we can do here is we can treat this time dependent part as a perturbation. Okay, except that in this case it's a time dependent perturbation. It actually depends on time. All right, so what happens here? Well, let's say uh, that, let's look at the situation where your perturbation happens to be zero. Okay, let's consider that as, and let's solve for our shorting, let's solve for our shorting equation. When this is true, what, what do we say? We have, we have stationary state solution, right? So when h prime, your perturbation is zero, we can solve for our wave functions, and what we get are, so the zero order wave functions that we get, are your stationary states. So these zero order wave functions are stationary states. They have well-defined energies. And your general solution can just be written as a linear combination of these stationary states because your zero order wave function, okay, there are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator. There are eigenfunctions of a Hermitian operator. Remember we postulated that they form a complete set. So any solution can be written as just a linear combination of these stationary states, right? So since your general solution is a linear, can be written as a linear combination of stationary states at any time, at any other time, okay? You can just say what, whatever your wave function is, you can write it as a linear combination. It's a constant times stationary state 1 plus another constant times stationary state 2 and so on, except that at any other time, these constants might, might be different. Okay? It's going to be different from the C1 and the C2. So I'm, I'm calling these different letters here. I'm calling them V1, V2, and so on. And I've explicitly indicated that they actually depend on time. They change over time. All right? So this is the general solution in terms of the zero order wave functions, okay? So let's consider the specific situation. This is a situation we're typically interested in because we're gonna apply this to spectroscopy. Let's say your system in a, it happens to be in a stationary state at time zero. Let's call that psi naught at quantum state n, okay? So quantum number n. Let's say for your particle in a box, n equals one or n equals five, whatever that is, okay? At time zero. 
Then imagine at time zero, you turn on the perturbation. The perturbation uh, comes on. And what could cause that perturbation to happen? It could be like you have a photon uh, colliding with your particle. Okay, so your, your particle is now exposed to electromagnetic radiation. So there's a perturbation that turns on at that particular instant. Okay, and it will, we're only going to look at the situations where that perturbation occurs only for a brief moment in time, from time equals zero to, let's say, time equals T prime. Okay? You turn on your perturbation, and then after time equals greater than T prime, okay, after a period of time, that perturbation disappears again. Okay? Uh, the kind of question we'd be interested in is, what happens after that? So if it's in quantum state size of n before it got hit by the light, by the photon, okay? It's not perturbed while, while the photon is there. And then after that, when the photon's gone, after uh, when the perturbation's gone, what's the probability that it's going to be in some other quantum state size of k? It's now going to be in a stationary state again, right? But it's not necessarily going to be psi n anymore. It's going to be some other quantum state size of k. Well, the probability that that's going to happen is just going to be the square of the coefficient of size of k at that point. Remember, at some other time, your psi is just going to be b1 psi1 plus b2 psi2 and so on and so forth. Whatever the square is of the coefficient will give you the probability that it's going to end up in that stationary state in another stationary state with quantum number k, let's say. All right? So that's the idea here. And like I said, we can use, we apply that, the major application of that is in spectroscopy, interaction of light with matter. You treat the interaction of light with matter as a time-dependent perturbation. So if you imagine, if you recall, if you have a plane polarized, electromagnetic wave propagating in the positive z direction, you can write the electric field vector as a sine wave or a cosine wave. We did this earlier in the lab, right? E naught sine 2 pi nu t minus 2 pi z over lambda. Okay, so this is for a wave that's traveling in the positive z direction. And your electric field, that will be oscillating one. Like that, right? So let's just say that the oscillation of your electric field is along the x-axis. Okay, so your plane polarized wave is is oscillating in the x-z plane. Okay, what is E here? E naught. That's the amplitude of your electric field wave. What's what? The, what's the interpretation of electric field? That's the force that a unit charge would feel at a given location, right? So multiply that by the actual charge. If you multiply that force by the actual charge, force per unit charge by the actual charge, you get, I mean, sorry, if you multiply the electric field by the actual charge, you get the force, okay? So uh, electric field multiplied by the charge, Q sub I, let's say you have charged particle I, it has a charge of Q sub I, Multiply that by the value of the electric field where charge I is located. That gives you the force acting on particle I. Okay. Now force, if you recall, is just the negative of the derivative of the potential energy with respect to X. So we can rearrange this to uh, say that the potential energy is the negative of the integral of F dx. And so what did we say our force was? It's just Q sub I times E, right? That's for each particle, so you have to sum that over all the particles. Okay? And so integral of force dx would just be, it's just fx, right? Uh, if we assume uh, zero to whatever x is. And so this would be your formula for your potential energy right here. Negative sum of Q sub I times X sub I, that's the location of particle I, times the electric field vector E. Okay, since E varies with time, our potential energy, okay, varies with time. 
So our potential energy varies with time. We have a time-dependent perturbation. Okay? That's the expression for your perturbation. Now, if we were to derive the formulas for the coefficients, remember we said our wave function is going to be what? V1 stationary state psi1 plus V2 stationary state psi2 and so on and so forth. The probability that it would end up in psi sub k would be proportional to the square of V sub k squared, right? And it turns out in this particular case that this, the coefficient V sub k at time t prime, okay? t prime is a moment where your perturbation disappears. It's just equal to this integral right here, psi sub k, and then your operator, you have summation of q sub i, x sub i, and then you have psi sub n. So if your system starts out at psi sub n, okay, let's say your system starts out at psi sub n, it could end up in psi sub k, or Psi sub k could be down here or up there, it doesn't matter, right? And so the probability that that's going to happen is going to be directly proportional to the square of this coefficient. It's going to be proportional to the square of this integral right here. This integral, if you'll notice, that's the sum of charge times location. Charge of each particle times location of each particle. That's just the formula for dipole moment. Okay, so this integral right here is called the transition dipole integral. And so we say that the probability that it's going to go from psi sub n to psi sub k after the perturbation is gone, okay, is directly proportional to the square of the transition dipole. It also turns out that that probability depends on the frequency of the light, the photon, okay, so not only does it depend on the transition dipole, it also depends on the frequency and how it matches with the energy difference between the allowed levels, okay? So nu kn here is just delta E, so this is E sub k, E sub n, so divided by h, that's your frequency. And this is negligible unless there's actually a match between the actual frequency of the photon. So this is for the photon. Okay, and this is nu kn. Okay? So either nu is equal to nu of kn or nu is equal to negative nu of kn. What does it mean when nu is equal to negative nu of kn? That means that E sub k is down here. So nu, negative nu kn would be a positive number. Okay? So, if there is a match, you can have absorption, or you can have what's called stimulated emission. Okay? So, uh, perturbation, time-dependent perturbation, resulting from interaction of light with an atom or an electron, okay, will occur... Uh, will lead to transition from one quantum state to another quantum state if the, the frequency, the energy of the photon matches that of the difference between the allowed energy levels. We learned that earlier as the Bohr frequency condition. And there's a second factor that determines whether it's going to happen, and that's the transition dipole. And the transition dipole is what led to what we referred to earlier as selection rules. Okay? So when we talk about selection rules, those are really rules based on the transition dipole. Basically, we, what selection rules tell us, if you have transitions where the transition dipole is zero, then those transitions are not going to happen. They're forbidden. You won't be able to observe them. So that uh, serves as the basis for explaining spectroscopy. It's a quantum mechanical basis. Okay. One thing this doesn't explain is spontaneous emission. Okay, and uh, that would require you to uh, um, invoke what's known as quantum field theory. You actually have to uh, 
this theory, at this level, the theory, our theory, time-dependent perturbation theory, cannot really explain spontaneous emission. An atom just giving off energy to go into a lower energy state. Now you'd have to do a quantum treatment of the electromagnetic field, okay? And that's uh, way beyond the subject of this uh, course. Okay? That would be a graduate level class. So that's time-dependent perturbation. And looks like that.